So anyways, um, I'll call the meeting to order and have the committee introduce themselves and and we'll get started. Yeah, Brian Collimore representing the Rutland District. Chris Pearson from uh, Chittenden County. Bobby Starr, Essex, Orleans County. Anthony Queen of Washington County. Uh, Ruth Hardy, Addison County, including all those kids from the Lincoln School. Thank you for waiting for me to do that. <laughs> so, uh, our first witness uh, on these uh, three pesticide bills is uh, Sarah Voss. So my name is Sarah Voss. I'm the state toxicologist at the health department. Our role at the health department is to assess or to to look at the health of, the health risk posed by chemicals, um, pesticides, chemicals in our environment. Um, we mostly look at the risk of these chemicals when they're in our air, water, soil, and food. So when we think about the risk of a chemical, we look at information from toxicology studies. Toxicology studies are those studies that are conducted in animals, and those often give us some really clear conclusions about the, the harm that a chemical can pose. Most of our safety levels that exist in Vermont and in the country are based on these animal studies. We also look at the epidemiology studies. Epidemiology studies are those that have been published looking at the health effects in people. And the studies looking at people can be a little bit less clear and that's because we as people have lots of different traits and habits that can make study interpretation a bit more difficult. So we, we always look at both the animal data and look to see if the same health effects are seen in human epidemiology data. And when we think about the risk to human health from a chemical, we always think about the, the toxicity, so how potent or how strong of a toxic chemical we're dealing with, and then we also have to look at exposure. Because if there's a, an incredibly toxic chemical that, is, that we're not exposed to, then there's really not a lot of risk to public health. So those are the pieces that go into an evaluation, some of the things that we think about when we look at the risk to human health from chemicals. So I'm going to just give you a quick summary of two of the pesticides on your list. Those are chlorpyrifos and glyphosate. And then we can, I'm happy to answer questions after. So I'll start with glyphosate. Glyphosate is the most widely used herbicide in the entire world. When it was first developed, it, it was developed to target a specific part of a plant cell that mammals don't have. And so this was a really good thing because as an herbicide, you want the chemical to kill the plants and to not harm humans. In 2015, the World Health Organization, which is an authoritative body, looked at glyphosate to see what potential it had to cause cancer. And the, the World Health Organization has a very standard process for looking at chemicals to determine how likely they are to cause cancer. And they have four categories that they can conclude. The strongest evidence is that a chemical is carcinogenic to human. Um, going down from that, the next level is that a chemical is probably carcinogenic to humans. The next level is possibly carcinogenic to humans. And then the lowest level is not classifiable as to carcinogenicity. So in 2015, the World Health Organization concluded that glyphosate was probably carcinogenic to humans. So that's the second strongest conclusion that they could have made. Prob probably? Probably. So that's also called group 2A. You might have seen category 1 is carcinogenic, 2A is probably, 2B is possibly, and 3 is not classifiable. That conclusion that the World Health Organization made in 2015 was based on all of the data, all the scientific papers that have been published in the open literature, so peer-reviewed literature that anyone from the public can go in and look at. 
the World Health Organization's conclusion differed from most regulatory conclusions. So there are regulatory bodies that yeah, review pesticides, including the US EPA and other equivalents in the world. Those regulatory agencies use the open literature, but they also use studies that are sent to them directly from the manufacturer of glyphosate. And in, in, that, in those situations, those studies are often uh, and are, are not available to the public. So the difference in, that, in the World Health Organization is they used all the studies available for public review. The regulatory agencies also include studies that are not available for public review. The World Health Organization's conclusion was based on evidence in animals, so evidence that glyphosate did increase the amount of tumors in animals. There was also some evidence in humans that people who were exposed had a higher increased risk of cancer. So that's all for glyphosate. <laughs> and um, does that show like uh, how, who did the, not who did the testing, but how severe was uh, the usage of the pesticide for the person to, uh, you know, they work in the factory where it's manufactured, were they applicators? Uh, did, did they go into any detail on their test results? So for the human studies that were reviewed, those were farmers, people who were working mm -hmm. and applying glyphosate, yes. Sir? Uh, Sir? I'm just trying to understand what you what you uh, presented. So the World Health Organization classified it as 2A. What did the EPA say? The EPA says that it is not carcinogenic to humans. Thank you. Not. not. Good. Yep. Uh, it's also true that the EPA in part makes, <clears throat> bases its findings on corporate corporate studies, you know, studies that were done by the manufacturers of the sellers, marketers of the glyphosate. Yes, that's true. So EPA and the other regulatory entities in the world do use the studies provided from the manufacturer. And So you could argue that the World Health Organization has less bias, potentially. It's certainly more transparent. Right, that's, that's right. Do, 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 does anybody have data about what um, the potential impact would be on uh, grazers that are eating plants that have been sprayed with glyphosate, sort of animal grazers. Yeah, yeah. You mean what it increase? Because you've been talking about humans and 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 so I'm just curious about sort of the in between stage here. So, so could there also be effects on animals from exposure to glyphosate? Um, there haven't been specific studies looking at that. You know, in general, um, things that cause or things that can contribute to cancer in humans usually act the same in all mammals. There are some exceptions to that, but that's usually the default assumption. How, how about for feet? You know, a lot of it, as I understand, it would would end up um, being applied to crops that turn into feed for animals. Have they? Trace that, or has it always been sort of the more direct? You see, maybe I'm not articulating well, but there may be someone else who can answer that. But our review is really focused on the human health aspects. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, because soybeans and in, in in Vermont, it's used heavily for soybean and corn, a lot for corn, right. because we grow a cover crop, we spray it with like this and so it kills the grass before you plant the corn. So the primary way that Vermonters are exposed are through the diet from the uses that you just mentioned. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions? No. So you can go on. Okay. Actually, no. just a quick one. Do you, maybe you don't know this or not. Is glyphosate banned or restricted in other parts of the world? There are some restrictions in other parts of the world. You know, they are they analyze or they assess pesticides differently in the EU. They have a different approach to the allowable level in drinking water, for example. Um, but I don't I don't know specifically which countries or cities have banned glyphosate. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, Rose? Are, are you, uh, is the Department of Health making a recommendation on this at all, or are you just providing us information? I and mean, what, what is your recommendation? Are you authorized to give one? <laughs> so I, I'm just giving some science background, but Shayla is here if, um, to answer any policy questions. Got it, great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, um, Brian? I'm sorry, just one more. Are there, are there any other states that uh, prohibit it? I believe that some cities have enacted restrictions across the country, but I don't have a list of those. I think I've read that in different news articles, but I don't have that with me. Thank you. Good? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I have a question out about life like to say, but just about your role, do, do you feel that the Department of Health has a slot on the, I can't remember, the committee, pesticide um, the pesticide advisory board? <clears throat> is that, do you take that slot or is that somebody else? Uh, yes, as of last summer, 2019, I fill that role for the health department. Okay. But it's not too demanding, I understand. You don't have any meetings, though, right? Mm -hmm. It's all verbal. We have had meetings. You have had? Yes, we have. thought we were told they don't ever meet. There had been but a period of not robust meetings. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I'll move on to chlorpyrifos? Yes. Okay. Chlorpyrifos is an organophosphate insecticide. And organophosphates are a class, a st chemical structure class of pesticides. And organophosphates target a specific neurotransmitter in our brain, and that's a specific um, messenger chemical that makes our muscles work and it makes our bodies work. And unlike glyphosate, organophosphates target the same part of our brain as it does in insects. So that means that organophosphates are very toxic to insects, but they're also very toxic to humans. Organophosphates and chlorpyrifos specifically are also associated with neurodevelopmental outcomes. So that means that when a pregnant woman is exposed to chlorpyrifos, her child later in life could have a higher risk for um, learning and memory problems or decreased IQ. So when EPA looked at chlorpyrifos to determine how much we're exposed to in 2016. They, they looked at how much we get from our diet because chlorpyrifos is used on a lot of produce. We often, you know, we eat a lot of chlorpyrifos residue from the food we buy. In 2016, the Office of Pesticides decided that the amount of chlorpyrifos that we're exposed to from the diet is thousands of times higher than it should be to protect from those brain effects in children. So in 2016, the Office of Pesticides recommended that chlorpyrifos not be used for food products anymore. The, uh, since 2016, that decision has been debated within EPA, but that recommendation in 2016 was based on um, the best available science to protect children's brains. And I, that's a compound that we don't sell here in Vermont any longer. It, it, I think Carrie can speak to that, but I, I believe that's true as well. No. From, okay. from your point of view, is there any danger to us uh, banning it outright in statute? I can only really comment on the scientific aspect of it. I think policy would have to be from Shayla. It's been supposed that <clears throat> since we have a de facto ban, that there's some wisdom to the agency having that flexibility. Um, do you see any where any any scenario that you can help us understand where we might be glad that we could suddenly release some? I can never say. Corpyrifos. Yeah, exactly. Could you see a scenario where that would be valuable to the public? To use chlorpyrifos? Where we would, you know, if we, if we effectively have a ban because we're not licensing sale of it, um, there's an argument that says, well, then it's no big deal if we ban it in statute. 
the counter argument seems to be, well, keep the agency, have some flexibility in case something happens where we want it. So I'm trying to understand where we would ever see some scenario where we might be glad that we can quickly apply some chlorpyrifos. Well, I will say that chlorpyrifos is only one of the organophosphates. There are other chemicals that work by the same mechanism. So if the goal of applying an organophosphate to target a specific <coughs> mechanism, if that's the goal, then there are other chemicals that could be used um, instead of chlorpyrifos. I mean, that's from my perspective. I, I don't know all of the uses of chlorpyrifos, though. <clears throat> what I think what we heard was uh, uh, apple orchards, if they have a certain outbreak of a certain pest, they, this product works very well to take care of that issue. Uh, but uh, haven't, we haven't had that problem here in Vermont for a while, so but well, I, I think it was the apple trees that, wasn't it? Is it used on apple trees? Do you know? Yeah, that's, and that's what we heard earlier. Yeah. In that case, I would, I would recommend that the question be asked, could another what else? organophosphate yeah. or carbamate, which is a different chemical structure that works the same way, um, could a different chemical yeah. be used? Uh, so um, my question is, generally, do organophosphates all work the same way as chlorpyrifos? Are there, is the whole class, has, has the EPA or other agencies reached a, the conclusions that you laid out based on the full <coughs> class or, of organophosphates, or is it just chlorpyrifos? For the effects on the children's brain, yeah. Right now, it's just chlorpyrifos. So other organophosphates do not target the same parts of the brain in humans as in insects, or, or not? so. Uh, so all organophosphates target that neurotransmitter in the brain, and that's why they're very um, acutely toxic. They can kill us and insects quite quickly. The effects on the child brain development probably do not happen by the same mechanism. So it's not really very well understood how chlorpyrifos can change the brain development, and it's not very well understood whether the other organophosphates do that as well. Is it because they haven't done the studies on the other organophosphates and the focus has been on chlorpyrifos? Or is it because they have done studies and not found to reach the same conclusion? The, the conclusions from chlorpyrifos are quite strong yeah. from the human literature. It's really the, the mechanistic studies, so those studies that are um, either in cells or in animal tissues trying to figure out exactly how the chemical is working where it just hasn't been clear for the other ones. I, I guess my, I, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that this is uh, a, a pesticide that we should not be using in Vermont, and I'm um, just wondering if there's a broader class of them that does the same thing as chlorpyrifos that we should be looking at more broadly, and it's just that this one has gotten the attention, um, or if it's just this one works in a different way. Well, e EPA does assume that all the organophosphates work the same way for that main mechanism of action, so it, you know, a lot of scientists do assume that organophosphates all work the same way in harming brain development. Mm -hmm. so it is certainly a possibility. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Um, no? I guess we can move on to the third. Oh, that's all I have. Oh, you had just the two? Well, um, you're not discussing atrazine today, correct? What, no. So actually, I mean, since you're here, yeah, I mean, my, my questions all along have been along this line of these are the two, I guess, where else we also have a bill that treated teas with new nicotinoids. But um, these two bills are the ones that sort of came to us, and I'm wondering if there are others that we should be focusing on instead or in addition to, or, you know, it, 
So atrazine is is highly used in Vermont, and so do you have conclusions about that that you can share? Um, sure. So atrazine is, uh, like you said, a widely used herbicide. Um, much like glyphosate, when it was developed, it was developed to target a specific part of a plant cell that humans don't have. So it seemed like this was a really, um, a really selective um, herbicide that would only target plants. Um, but atrazine is now recognized as an endocrine disruptor by the Centers for Disease Control as well as by the US EPA. Um, chemicals that interact with the endocrine system have the potential to change our ability to reproduce, to make it harder for women to get pregnant, and to also change um, the quality of the male reproductive system. Uh, chemicals that interact with the endocrine system are also worrisome because they can interfere with our bodies at very, very low levels. Our endocrine system responds to extremely low levels of hormones inside of our bodies. So that means that very, very low levels of chemicals that are endocrine receptors could have an effect in our bodies. The, the conclusions that were made um, about atrazine being an endocrine disruptor and having reproductive effects were based on evidence in animals with supporting evidence in, in humans. So has there been a, lo a, lo a large study that links, has there been a study that links the, the decline in uh, reproductive uh, fertility, thank you, to, um, to to atrazine or uh, similar pesticides, or is it just on an individual basis? There have been studies that look at the length of the menstrual cycle, which is a, you know, obviously an effect of the reproductive system, mm -hmm. and there have been studies that look on other birth outcomes, so things that are um, endpoints that are known to be reproductive effects. So there have been those studies in, in humans. Yeah. And what is the conclusion that, this, that it has, a, that it has an effect? That, that atrazine does interfere with the endocrine system. Okay. Thank you. Yep. How much? Oh, sorry. Well, just a follow-up on that. How much? How might people be most exposed to atrazine? Is it from eating things or being around the environment? How? Where? How do we inter interface with atrazine? People are exposed to atrazine primarily from contaminated drinking water. When EPA looked at how much was in our diet, they did not find that we're getting very much atrazine from the food. Yes. Sarah, I'd like to go back to the pesticide advisory board a little bit because I'm start trying to understand that. We hear a lot of variation from it never meets to it's had vacancies that haven't gone filled. Now we understand those have been filled. But I'm trying to understand, sort of broadly speaking, I mean, as our, as the, the are you the state toxicologist? Yes. The one and only. Um, <laughs> You know, how do you, how would you advise us? I mean, it feels to me like we are further and further down this road where we feel trapped. Glyphosate, as a good example, what everybody tells us is the less we use glyphosate, the more we're going to use atrazine. And, and, the, and, and, you know, it'll be replaced by chemicals that we want even less than glyphosate. And, and so there, there's this sort of feeling of being trapped. And I'm curious, and you've only been seated on the board it sounds like for a little while but have you ever do, do, do you feel like the board is serving the role that I think it was conceived of which is somebody that would help us digest this stuff and in, in order to do that say no sometimes I mean it doesn't seem like you don't hear about that I hear about some things Carrie does through the regulatory angle but I, I just would like to understand better the board and how you see it functioning. So VPAC, when I've been on VPAC, they haven't, we haven't taken up the issue of atrazine or glyphosate, but I know that VPAC has discussed some other pesticide uses, um, and I think there have been some favorable outcomes, but they might not have been as high profile as glyphosate or atrazine, you know, changes in those uses. Do you think, I also worry that 
we have a system where applicators just have to sort of get trained, assert that they, you know, are, or they're following the rules in terms of how, how these chemicals are applied, and then we sort of say, good, you're good, you're green lit, go for it. As opposed to having any standard where people need to assert that this is why I have to use this, or if I don't use it, this is this is you know what I'm trying to overcome. There there is a prophylactic. Uh, I mean, it seems like it's being applied uh, ahead of any um, real need necessarily or material need, and I'm curious if. What, if you th have thought about that, or if you guys, if you're aware of any discussion about that at the board, um, or just what you think as, as somebody that's charged with helping the state understand this. VPAC hasn't discussed that specific issue. Um, it sounds like a lot of what you describe is within the Agency of Agriculture's um, purview regarding how applicators are trained and how they are hired to apply pesticides. <clears throat> do, you, do, you, do you worry, though, about the sort of prophylactic use as opposed to, like, should we be worried about that? Well, maybe not worried from your point of view, but are, are you aware of prophylactic use? Maybe you think that way. I know that some people, I know glyphosate is approved for use on residential lawns. People may choose to use it to prevent things like weeds. Is that what you mean by prophylactic use? Yeah, just yeah. use willy-nilly because I think I need it whether it's proven or not. Like we talked a little bit before about it was mentioned that apples are in danger of a certain pest that maybe you'd have to use chemical to use. Um, but that's different than just saying, well, it's, 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 it's April, so I'm going to spread my, my glyphosate or my atrazine whether it's like, proven that I need it or not. Mm -hmm. It's just a habit. I mean, it brings up the question of how much we're being exposed to. Right. So, you know, EPA has looked at exposures based on how glyphosate is used. Um, I focused on the diet exposure. Um, I didn't review the exposures from turf use, from residential lawn use. Can I have your question, <clears throat> So, um, anything else on the atrazine? No. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Maddie Kempner, and I'm policy director for the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont. You know, for Vermont. Um, I am going to testify on all four of the bills, so bear with me. I have uh, a lot to share. Also, just um, so I know, how much time do I have? A little bit. What's you need? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, I have a lot to say. Um, Nova Vermont's mission is to promote organic practices to build an economically viable, ecologically sound, and socially just Vermont agricultural system that benefits all living things. I feel like it's important to start with that because it feels um, incredibly pertinent to this topic today. Um, and I'll start by saying that while we strongly support efforts <clears throat> to phase out the most harmful agricultural chemicals, um, as some of these proposals would do in the near term, our work and our vision is in service to a long-term transition that changes agriculture's impact on human and ecological health from a negative one to a positive one. That's really the work that we are setting up to do. Um, and would love to see that transition in the long term with respect to agricultural chemical use. Uh, we believe this transition is not only possible but a necessary antidote to our most pressing ecological and public health challenges. Organic production continues to grow year after year, as you may know, both nationally and here in Vermont. Um, just to share briefly some statistics from 2019, Vermont Organic Farmers, which is our USDA accredited certification program, um, certified 150,654 acres organically here in Vermont. 682 farms and 93 processors, and $354,456,974 in gross sales of organic products. These figures represent certified organic production and sales, but I think it's also important to acknowledge many producers who are using organic practices in Vermont who may, be, who may not be certified. Um, Long-term field trials in the US, not to mention the thousands of smallholder farmers feeding the majority of people throughout the world, have shown the potential for organic practices to not only match, but in some cases exceed the yield and profitability of conventional agriculture while consistently leading to improved environmental outcomes. 
Um, to share, some of you may be familiar with Rodale's now nearly 40 year farming systems trial. Um, that's an in field trial comparing conventional organic systems. It has shown that organic yields, organic systems are competitive with conventional yields after a five year transition period. Produ um, Organic systems produce yields up to 40% higher in times of drought, which we are projected to see more of with climate change, earn three to six times greater profits for farmers than conventional, leach no toxic chemicals into waterways, use 45% less energy, and release 40% fewer carbon emissions. Um, these latter statistics are obviously critical when we think about an agricultural solution to climate change. Um, all of this is to say that we view organic agriculture as the viable long-term solution to our human health and ecological challenges, and to quote from one of the many studies that I reviewed in preparing for this testimony of the deleterious effects of the impacts of neonicotinoids on pollinators specifically, as long as field applied acute toxins remain the basis of agricultural pest control practices, society will repeatedly be forced to weigh the benefits of pesticides against their collateral environmental damage. And we'll be back here having this conversation over and over again. Um, so with respect to S180, the ban on chlorpyrifos, we strongly support an immediate ban on this chemical in Vermont based on evidence of human health impacts, which you've heard, and lack of proven need. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful that chlorpyrifos is not widely used and has not, in fact, um, been approved for use in Vermont. Um, we would like to see that codified in statute. Um, as to, to repeat what you may have heard, in the 2006 paper, a team of researchers at Columbia University found that when children were exposed to chlorpyrifos in the womb, they tended to be smaller, have poor reflexes, and show higher risk of having ADHD and other developmental disorders years after being exposed. Another team of researchers in Berkeley made similar findings, and since then, peer-reviewed publications have provided strong evidence of the neural de developmental toxicity of chlorpyrifos. Um, also, you may have heard that Cortiva, which is the largest manufacturer of, of chlorpyrifos, is phasing out its production by the end of this year. It's also been banned in Hawaii, California, the European Union, and soon to be New York State. And I want to share, based on some of the questions that have been asked already today, we specifically support a ban on chlorpyrifos enacted by the legislature. Um, we don't want to see a situation here in Vermont that mirrors what happened at the federal level where a change in administration led to the allowance of this pesticide with documented negative health impacts that the previous administration had outlawed. Um, you've probably heard that in 2016, Obama, the Obama administration, the EPA, had decided at the um, recommendation of its own scientists to ban chlorpyrifos to um, reverse that ruling. Did, can I ask a question? Sure. The states that have banned it, did they do that by statute or that's regulatory? California and Hawaii, my understanding is, both banned it by statute. New York State did not. Um, the legislature actually did pass a ban, but Governor Cuomo vetoed that and passed the decision on to his um, agriculture agency or the environmental agency. <coughs> Um, that's all I have in the here, folks, if anybody else has questions on that. <clears throat> mm. But if, is it the, just one company going to stop producing this, or how many companies produce it? I don't know how many. I know Corteva AgroScience is the largest manufacturer of chlorpyrifos, and they are the ones who are stopping production this year. Um, I don't know how many other companies are making it, but they're the main one, essentially. Okay. okay. Um, with regard to S192, the glyphosate ban bill, we strongly support transitioning away from glyphosate based on evidence of widespread environmental contamination and health impacts. Um, as you may have heard, glyphosate is consistently found in urine and breast milk sam samples and many food products. Um, we also understand that the widespread use of glyphosate in Vermont uh, currently poses challenges to a swift change in practices. Um, so what I would like to share with the committee as you know an approach to consider with respect to glyphosate is a targeted approach that would restrict its use um, among the most vulnerable populations and for example massachusetts currently has three bills up for consideration in their legislature um, which could serve as a model here in vermont as well um, which would restrict restrict glyphosate for homeowner use similar to what was done with neonicotinoids last year here in vermont um, it would ban its use on school grounds public parks and playgrounds which would reduce exposure for children who are um, <clears throat> disproportionately impacted by these chemicals and um, re would restrict its use on public land in general. So those are three bills that are um, being proposed in Massachusetts and I know at least some of those already passed out of their agriculture committees. I'm not sure where all three of them stand exactly, but um, as I said, we would love to see a swift transition away from glyphosate. We are concerned about the potential for that to mean a transition to more harmful chemicals. Um, but in the meantime, it feels like an intermediate step could be to ban these chemicals 
in these particular instances um, <coughs> where children are particularly uh, in harm's way. We, we've, uh, I think, had some testimony that the uh, highway agency, V-Trains, mm -hmm. is a big user of this um, for guardrails, around guardrails, signs. Mm -hmm. It was, you were uh, talking in regards to that when you said public properties? Um, that's a good question, and I'm not sure what Schools the Schools I could approach. understand, uh, yeah. you know, near waterways, uh, but I'm yeah. wondering. I, I mean, I would recommend asking that question of Mike Bald, who I think is testifying today, um, in terms of non-chemical management of right-of-ways and, and roadsides. Um, but that, you know, personally, a roadside application of glyphosate is, is equally concerning to me in terms of proximity to people's yards where children might be playing. Um, I personally live really close to a, a fairly busy road and have a small child and um, I'm not comfortable with that kind of chemical being sprayed on the guardrail that's, you know, in that close proximity to where my kids and pets are playing. Any other questions? Well, are you going to move on from glyphosate? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Because I, I wanted to just make sure I heard you right. I thought you said something about, or we've heard that the concern about weaning ourselves off the glyphosate, we may end up with using more harmful chemicals. Is that something you can talk about? I, I just, yeah, I mean, that's a concern that I hear raised a lot, and I. Um, certainly would not want to see an increase in atrazine, for example, where we'd abandon glyphosate and not the other, um, which is why, again, our sort of long-term vision um, is a transition to, away from agricultural practices that rely on this sort of chemical treadmill approach of moving from one to the next. And while, you know, over centuries we've come a long way from using um, things like arsenic, you know, the, the pesticides we use have improved they are in also more widespread use and are causing more environmental damage than they, than they did in terms of scale um, at that time. And so our long-term approach is to transition away from these chemicals altogether. But I do have a concern about transitioning in the short term to a more harmful. Have uh, you know if the European community, for example, has restricted or banned glyphosate? I'm not sure what the current status is. I know that they were considering it. Um, and I'm not sure what they decided, actually, in the end. It's a good question. Okay, uh, next one. All right, uh, next is the S266, which would phase out the use of neonic treated seeds. Um, we strongly support this bill. We strongly support phasing out the use of neonic treated seeds in Vermont based on the substantial body of evidence linking neonics to pollinator declines as well as harm to other non target species such as birds and aquatic life. Um, and contrary to previous belief that neonics pose limited risk to mammals, increasing evidence is now linking neonicotinoids to human health impacts and impacts on wildlife. Uh, we further support phasing out the use of neonic treated seeds as they're applied prophylactically and without proven need to nearly all conventional corn seed planted in the United States currently. And finally, research by the Center for Food Safety in 2014 found um, a lack of effectiveness um, on the part of neonics in terms of um, the pests and the, the claims that they make around uh, improved yields. So you may have heard a lot of evidence uh, regarding the links between neonicotinoids and pollinator declines. Um, I wanted to share uh, a little bit more about the human health impacts that are kind of more recently being discovered. Um, so in a recent letter from a group of environmental health scientists and health professionals to EPA Administrator, Administrator Andrew Wheeler, a literature review found a link between unintentional human exposure to neonics and an elevated risk of developmental and neurological damage. The effects linked neonic exposure include linked to neonic exposure include malformations of the developing heart and brain, autism spectrum disorder, and a cluster of symptoms including memory loss and finger tremors. And while the authors note that the studies to date have limitations, they warn that given the widespread use of neonicotinoids in agriculture and household products and its increasing detection in U.S. food and water, more studies on the human health effects of chronic non-acute neonicotinoids exposure are needed. So we are concerned about human health effects there. There have also been studies that have found um, health effects in white-tailed deer populations. I'm not sure if anyone's presented those, but I'm happy to share that if that's of interest. Um, in terms of lack of proven need and also availability of alternatives, I think um, I wanted to share, for example, looking at the organic model um, and the organic regulations, one criteria used in the Organic Foods Production Act by which materials are reviewed for approval in organic production is essentiality. 
uh, a material may be added to the national list of allowed substances in cases where that material is deemed essential for production. For, for example, like yeast and bread or bacterial cultures of yogurt, um, additives that are, that are really deemed essential and not just more convenient for, um, for production of a particular product. So we share, support this approach generally with respect to Vermont's approval of various agricultural chemicals and in particular with regard to neonicotinoids. Uh, as I mentioned, neonic seed treatments are applied prophylactically on nearly all conventional corn seed across the United States. Um, and in conversations I've had recently with several seed dealers, there are alternative non-neonic chemical seed treatments that are increasing in demand by producers based on concerns about pollinator impacts. Um, and I think this is potentially a positive development, but we're still concerned about the overall reliance on these type of chemical treatments and we support a transition toward farming practices such as those used in organic production that avoid pest pressure, for example, by um, implementing diverse crop rotations and other non-chemical means. There are also wholly non-GMO, untreated, or organic seed options available. Um, and understanding, again, through these conversations I've been having with seed dealers, uh, the, one of the concerns about banning neonics uh, seed, as a seed treatment is their ability, along with widely applied fungicide applications that just come on all of these seeds, um, whether there's a proven need or not. Um, these seed coatings can allow conventional producers to plant earlier in the spring and can um, allow them to deal with you know, challenging wet and cold soil conditions. Um, however, there are breeders currently working on developing more resilient organic varieties that can withstand these pressures without the use of seed treatments, um, which we really see as a crush to deal with um, some of these pressures versus a more holistic system that addresses them. Um, there are also biologic treatments, some currently available and some in development that are, or are approved or will be approved for organic production um, and would provide a better alternative to producers in terms of you know, substituting that particular seed treatment for another um, mm -hmm. while longer term breeding projects are in process and, and while we're in the process of hopefully transitioning away from um, chemical treatments altogether. <coughs> and then I wanted to share a brief quote from the Center for Food Safety 2014 report on the ineffectiveness of neonic seed treatments that I mentioned. Uh, they say, neonic seed treatments which account for over 90% of neonics in agriculture are largely ineffective and lead to significant pollution. Typically about 1 to 10% and often no more than 2% of the neonic treatment enters the target plant, leaving the remainder to contaminate soil, water, and nearby plants. EPA concluded in a 2014 report that these seed treatments provide little or no overall benefits to soybean production in most situations. Public, published data indicate that in most cases there is no difference in soybean yield when soybean seed was treated with neonicotinoids versus not receiving any insect control treatment. Similar reports are emerging on the ineffectiveness of corn seed treatment. Yet neonic seed treatments are on almost all corn seeds, most soybean seeds, and most other grain and oil seed crops in the US. Um, I think by passing this ban, on neonic seed treatments that would provide an appropriate timeline for implementation. Vermont could do a lot of good in forcing the market to provide non-treated options um, that you know, could grow over time and availability across the country. So I do appreciate that this bill has a, a slower timeline for implementation to allow the market <coughs> to comply. Uh, one question, uh, I think you mentioned soil and water contamination from Munich. Uh, last week, I believe it was, we had Miner Institute here, mm -hmm. and uh, they testified to the fact they had two test sites over at Miner mm -hmm. that they've been monitoring, and uh, they detected no Munich in their uh, pipe water, you know, their tiles. Okay. And, and they, they couldn't detect any, so I was wondering mm -hmm. where did the information come from that you had that showed that it did contaminate, say, water? Yeah, um, so there are several studies that are quoted in this, uh, what's a lit review from the Center for Food Safety, um, and I'm happy to share this with you because it would, it would say the exact studies that that came from where this where neonics are being found um, to contaminate water, and I don't have that off the top of my head, um, but I'm happy to share that. Um, <clears throat> I do think it's it's hopeful that these are being found potentially in at least these two test sites here in Vermont, but that doesn't necessarily indicate that there aren't contaminating soil and water in other parts of the state. Um, also, one of the other concerns about neonicotinoids is that they're systemic, meaning that they infiltrate every part of the plant. Um, and when they're included as a treatment on corn seed, they're also taken up by pollen and nectar in all parts of the plant, and they can be exuded um, through 
precipitation water that, that corn plants produce that pollinators then can um, imbibe and do damage that way. So there are a lot of other concerns beyond just the soil and water contamination. There are a lot of ways that these chemicals um, stay in the environment and reach non-target species that we're concerned about as well. So whether you find it in the water or not, or not is different than the impact on pollinators. So they have an impact on pollinators regardless of whether we find it in the water because yeah. pollinators get them from the plant itself. Right. Absolutely. And birds, you know, could be taking them up directly by ingesting seed that's left or left around or uh, there's a lot of other ways that they're impacting other species beyond just water contamination. So I have a really broad question. I mean, if some of what you cited said that these things are not even working. In other words, they don't really have the results that they're supposedly going to have. Why do farmers use them so much? They just come on all the seed. It's yeah. not really a choice currently, and that's why I think this bill could do a lot of good by providing an option um, for producers who currently really don't have an option when they're sourcing conventional corn seed. It just comes on the seed. The, the seed is treated with um, a whole slew of fungicides and insecticides before they even or you know, ordered by the producer. And so I think that's why this bill, with an appropriate timeline for implementation, could really you know, force manufacturers to provide an alternative in cases where there really isn't a proven need for these things. And we can sort of start to shift, at least, toward a more precautionary approach and only using these chemicals where they're absolutely being necessary. Um, right now, it's really, when you speak to seed dealers, almost all seed just comes coated with this stuff, whether it's needed or not. And that's a huge concern because of the acreage across the country where it's being used. Chris? So you are plucking at themes that I've been trying to explore in terms of um, the, the, the relative ease that we um, give farmers and other applicators for using these chemicals. Um, I am interested in some standard that, that speaks to, I have to use this because, you know, and, and I'm curious if you've done any thinking about how we would just do that logistically. Like, should that be an applicator having to assert that they need it, or should there be some standard? Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I've been trying. That would be a big change. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I would love your thinking on on how we could mechanically go there. Well, I think that that's one thing that I see potential for in reforming the VPAC. Um, and that's what I was going to say. It feels like the VPAC, if, if its mandate is to be strengthened and if maybe some of the seats on the board are to be changed to include um, you know, folks with particular knowledge of both the need and the health impacts, that could become a step in that process um, that doesn't currently exist where we're reviewing these things based on actual need. Um, I think we also really need buy-in from the Ag Agency to to include that type of review and those considerations in their process of risk assessment for these chemicals. Um, I mean, even at the federal level, the way that risk assessment is done by the EPA for pesticides doesn't incorporate things like, it doesn't consider things like cumulative effects, synergistic effects of different chemicals being used on the same plot. Um, and really, our process here at the state level mirrors that federal process and is really limited in the actual risk that it's taking into account. Um, so I think at least the VPAC could be one step in the right direction to start to um, structurally incorporate those considerations. Thank you. Did, did you testify that your organic farmers that grow corn, they do not use neonics, right? No. So uh, have you also uh, done tests <coughs> on tonnage per acre uh, organic farms compared to conventional farms on tonnage per acre mm -hmm. that's produced? Um, I, we personally haven't done studies on that. They may exist. Um, I'm happy to look into that and share them with you if I can find those studies. Um, I know one of the challenges, for example, with glyphosate is that in conventional no-till, there's, you know, there's a lot of excitement around improving soil health, which we are you know, very much on board with. We see soil health as um, having so many benefits for water quality and climate stability and um, a lot of positive environmental outcomes, but we are really concerned about the uptake and the use of conventional no-till because it does rely so heavily on just increasing applications of herbicide. Um, and so, you know, on the organic side, we are also kind of in this early stage 
period of, um, of starting to explore and research effective no-till um, methods for organic production that don't rely on herbicide. And on the organic side, with particular regard to no-till, um, that's a challenge, but we're seeing lots of potential for that technology to be adopted, um, that kind of mechanical approach to be adopted, especially in the Midwest, are having a lot of success with it. Um, and so, yeah, with regard to seed treatments, this is just something that's never been allowed in organic production. And so the, with regard to seed treatments, it's really just an entirely um, different system, holistically, of pest management, where we're not necessarily relying on those crutches of seed treatments, but we're relying on crop rotations and other you know, non-chemical methods. See, the thing that concerns me is that most of our organic farms, for the large part, are under 100 animals. And many of our conventional farms are above 100 animals, a lot larger. Mm -hmm. And if they had to do 25 to 50 percent more cropping on these larger farms to get the same yields as they're getting now, mm -hmm. it would seem like we'd have a lot more um, runoff problems uh, and we'd have other problems that, would, that we'd have to address. Mm. So, you know, there is a balance and, and it, you know, instead of having, then you have more equipment running over more ground Mm -hmm. using more fuel, polluting the air more. I mean, it, it's really a, a, a thing that we'd have to weigh, I think, very carefully. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because I, I had a neighbor, that, a farmer neighbor, and he went and did some experimenting uh, with, you know, not using any neonics, two fields, uh, probably 500 feet apart, same soil types. And the one where he tried it without, you know, they were small fields, two, two or three acre fields. The one where he tried to grow without using any uh, major chemicals, you could almost count the, you could, you could count the stalks of corn in there. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other field, I mean, it grew like we normally see uh, cornfields. So, you know, there is an issue there. Yeah, I understand that, but I think there's a, a, also a transition period that you have to incorporate because I think, like I'm saying, the transition away from these seed treatments is one thing, but a transition to really an entirely different system of cropping um, is where you start to see potentially better you know, yields versus just a one-year change in a small, you know, trial like that, um, which is really just changing one thing about the production type versus a more holistic shift to non-chemical practices. You, there is a transition period that is, um, you know, can be challenging for producers to get through, but once they get through that, they find all of these other benefits like I, that I listed from organic production um, that really address some of those trade-offs that you're, you're talking about with regard to you know air pollution, soil contamination, things like that. Um, also, I think it would be really interesting to explore, especially with regard to you know the implementation timeline of phasing out the use of these seed treatments, to explore in the meantime the options that are available that are you know biologically based that are approved for organic production that could still, you know, in, in organic production we don't tend to support an approach that we think of as input substitution, where you're just you know, supporting uh, a transition away from one chemical or, or external input for another. But in this case, I think as a stopgap, if there are biologic options that are approved for organic use as seed treatments, that could be a good way for producers to sort of um, address that, that, that you know, growing pain that you're talking about in transitioning away from these practices altogether. So I think those options are worth exploring. Maybe you already just said this, but um, I thought earlier in your testimony you talked about comparing yields of organic versus chemical agriculture and the yields were as good or better than organic. Did I hear that? Correctly? Yeah, particularly um, what the Rodale trials have found is in drought years yeah. that organic yeah. um, yields consistently outcompete conventional, um, up to 40% higher in drought yields. Um, and then what they found, and this is again an almost 40 year trial, it started in 1981, um, they found that 
organic systems are competitive with conventional yields at, after this transition period, which is what I'm talking about. So in that transition, there can be challenges because you're changing from a system that's really been reliant on these sort of chemical crutches um, to one that is a more holistic system that relies on sort of natural processes and biology. Um, so it is a slow transition, but after that period, the yields can be competitive. I don't, want to, I don't want to go down a whole other road, but I presume that there's some opportunity to think about ecosystem services and making that transition, this transition. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think there is a lot of potential there, and I think it's really exciting to consider um, a system that would potentially, you know, address all of these what I see as the positive ecological outcomes that we could have from farming that are currently not accounted for in the way that our markets work. Um, producers who are farming in such a way that's building soil health and cleaning water are really providing services that are public good that aren't currently being recognized or compensated for. Uh, so I think it's particularly if we can find ways to compensate farmers for you know, proven outcomes to the extent that that's possible, uh, that will sort of naturally allow producers to shift toward practices that have those benefits. Um, in ways that also still allow them to innovate and use the practices that are the best fit for their particular land, which farmers really um, generally know best. So I think there is a lot of potential for that um, as a part of the long-term approach as well. Any other questions on this? Uh, do you have another one? I don't. I was going to say some words about the VPAC form, but I feel like we sort of covered that. Um, yep. Just that we support that, and I do think that that's a place where this sort of concern about, or the considerations of um, essentiality and proven need can be incorporated into our current practices. And um, could you send Linda some of your data? Because I'm, I, I mean, I have very strange feelings about not using any chemicals to using chemicals and having the same yields. Uh, you know, I've grown a garden a few times, and um, it usually doesn't work that way. So I'd, I'd like to get that study and look at that. Are you rotating your crops? <laughs> Are you rotating your crops in your garden? <laughs> well, I just like learn how to do that. Yeah. You know, how to grow crops and without any chemicals in get uh, just as good a results because it would save millions of dollars nationwide. Absolutely. Um, so, my wife said, so you have to do it. I honestly, I think that that should not be understated, um, that there are real economic benefits to farming in such a way that doesn't rely on outside inputs. And that's really one of the things that organic producers do find beneficial, that they're spending less money on inputs. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely a part of the consideration for us too. Um, and I think that 775 certified operations could talk to you about how they're being successful without the use of these tools. Yeah. Thank Matt, you. Maddie, you Thank had a, you. a term of art, essentiality, and the next one is similar vein of, of the approach to essentiality was essentiality one Essentiality is what's, what it's called within the organic regulations. And what, what was another term though you said you said was Proven need. Is that a term of that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Good morning. Good morning. I'll read this. So thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to testify on S-272. I know I spoke last Friday partially. I'll try not to repeat. Um, but I know there may have been some questions remaining, so I'll, uh, I'll try to address. Tell us your name. I'll try to cover it. I'll start. Mike Bald, Royalton, Vermont, founder, owner of the company Got Weeds which is long-term management of invasive species, non-native species, non-chemical methods, transitioning landscapes to fulfill the owner's vision for the space. I do eradicate, I do suppress, I do contain, but um, oftentimes if you cannot eradicate, you just make sure you favor and foster the desired ve vegetation over the undesired oriental bittersweet, honeysuckle. <coughs> Buckthorn, which is what this is. <clears throat> um, Got Weeds is in its 10th year of uh, managing landscapes, and I've been managing invasive species since 2004. I have a biology degree, service in the US Army Corps of Engineers, and service in the US Forest Service. 
think that's the relevant background. <clears throat> so thank you again for the opportunity to testify on S-272. I appreciate the testimony you've received so far, and I shall seek to supplement rather than repeat that. I have attended numerous VPAC meetings since, I think, the 2013 timeframe, solely for the purpose of educating and informing myself at my own expense. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not here today. I've not gone to meetings looking for business or, or self-promotion. I have listened and I've occasionally submitted comments. <clears throat> I covered the second qualification for speaking today that I manage vegetation professionally. That's throughout New England and I present, I present from Michigan to Massachusetts and I suppose beyond. Um, <clears throat> You've heard a great deal regarding the purpose of the Advisory Council and its failings. I can offer further examples in this arena, but do wish to acknowledge that the membership does operate professionally and can be proud of worthy accomplishments. There are things not happening here that are good. I acknowledge that here, meaning here in Vermont. I have said in the past, however, that the overall performance of the VPAC is still summarized as a mission fail. This leads to my overriding point today, which is the failure of the VPAC does not rest on the shoulders of the council itself, but is, it's rather a reflection of the national fascination with better living through chemistry. When VPAC was created, the stated goals were a fit for that moment in time. No member of the public then could have known that herbicides would become such a profit maker with more and more uses identified and recklessly promoted. <laughs> the desire for ever more profit has driven us to this day and age where our usage is exponentially more than was even conceivable in earlier times. The global warming scenario offers a parallel example, immediate profit ahead of common sense and scientific integrity. So we sit here today facing not only a massive increase in annual usage, but also an unknown toxic legacy resulting from decades of untracked pesticide usage. We may have tracked select quantities over select time spans, but we've not tracked or explored cumulative effects or other relevant factors that may contribute to declining soil health. So I said this on Friday, the urgency today is real, very real, much more so than previous <clears throat> decades. The only remotely good news is that we have sidelined a handful of the most toxic pesticides. Although those bans are relative positives, yes, Exemptions still exist, and a slew of proprietary corporate secrets are still tolerated. So there has been some good, and there are still exemptions. I need to make a point here, which I did not make on Friday. One of our most glaring issues regarding land management practices and public health is that public participation is low, almost non-existent. Yes, public engagement is complicated, but in recent years, we have allowed a televised, real-time, participatory public meeting model to fall by the wayside. We have made it more difficult for people to participate in what they see as meaningful ways. I can't recall the name of the system, but I do remember going to Vermont Tech and participating in, the, in these televised meetings. I thought it was a pretty brilliant tool for, en for engaging people. But that is no longer available for, I suppose, uh, economic reasons. People can still comment and vote and speak, but they express little confidence that input will be taken seriously or make any difference when they do speak up. By way of example, the process nowadays is so long that it absolutely kills public participation. That may be intentional, for all I know. Sometimes it's the NEPA process, sometimes it's sta developing statewide policy. But process has to accommodate people, not drag on for six years and wear them down. And I can, that's, Forest Service management plans, wildlife refuge system, six years of planning to come up with a, a management plan for, for that's, people just, they, they comment and they give up. Meetings are often held around midday for any member of the public who has to travel. This becomes a full day commitment and costs easily three to $400 in travel fees and lost wages. If we continue to assist, insist on daytime meetings, I've got a daytime meeting on Friday with the Invasive Exotic Plant Council. I'm glad to be a member of the council, but again, three, four hundred dollars on the negative side. If that's going to continue, please fund and issue headlamps for those of us who work outdoors by the light of day so we can do our work at night if that's the need. 
I have submitted comments to the National Wildlife Refuge System, the Watershed Tactical Basin Planning Process, <coughs> the Pollinator Protection Committee, Outdoor Recreation Initiative. I can count on one hand the number of times I've ever heard back or seen follow-up to my input. And I, I'll give you a specific example. Dicamba is now unfolding to be a disaster in the Midwest. And NPR reported last week that complaints were down in Missouri. But the deeper dig revealed that people had simply given up on reporting violations. The state can't keep up and investigate and cover the ground, and people just they hang up the phone, because who wants to wait on hold? So when people do comment, this has happened to me, input just doesn't make it into the meeting notes. And this happened with the Pollinator Protection Committee. I asked in a public meeting why the focus solely on neonics. We're missing the whole cumulative effects conversation if we don't include glyphosate and atrazine and dicamba. My comment did not make it into the notes, which is really odd. So that's why I come here to make sure you hear that point get made. I commented at the VPAC last year, last March. I offered, I've got the notes right in front of me here and it's in the written testimony that I provided to Linda. The notes were copied, my, what I wrote in here is copied directly from the meeting notes, but they failed to capture the point that I made, which is offering to assemble a team of citizens to put together annual, annual pesticide data reports at no charge to the agency. I made that offer, it did not make it into the notes. This offer would have alleviated staff and cost bottlenecks that have hampered agency leadership but the offer somehow didn't make it into the meeting notes. I had a chemist standing by, I'm a biologist, I'm not claiming we would have put together a, a ready to go report, but the government does it all the time. A initial housing <laughs> report, initial jobs report, and then they modify it, update it the next month. They, they finalize it. So I would have been happy to put together a draft. I'm glad to see that some of the data is actually making it out. But it is hard to explain how Public input does not make it into the notes. I'm personally not a good note taker, so I'm sympathetic to the issue, but it's a, it's a problem. Public engagement is broken. Continuing, VPAC, I made this point Friday, and I would like to just elaborate on it slightly. The VPAC, the council's not getting the information it needs to empower decision making. 2016, the summer drought, no rain to the southern reaches of the state. The Pioneer Valley, right across the border, saw no rain after May 1st. This is per conversation with farmers all over the Pioneer Valley. Drought condition equates to major stress on all types of vegetation, as well as on soil microbes. There were also, at the time of this drought, three exotic pest beetles, HWA, ALB, and EAB. So the emerald ash, Asian longhorn, hemlock woolly. Why would any regulatory or advisory body permit use of pesticides or toxins under such high stress conditions. The northern part of the state was in a similar, similar drought. So very northern Vermont was also in this severe drought. Why would you add more stress to a climate with disturbance events and huge swings in water table and ground conditions? Why would we introduce yet another stress into that landscape? It never comes into the conversation. And what brought that to my attention was a power company talking about doing a test run on a new pesticide in southern Vermont. Where is academia? Where, where is the focus on cumulative effects? And why does a member of the public have to speak up and say, please talk to your county forester as a minimum? Because he or she will know, hey, think about this. Think about working north slope, south facing slope. Consider a time of year. Put that into the, the thinking. Doesn't happen. That's my point. I'll move on to saying that pesticide usage is now an environmental constant. Like acid rain once was, and like the flyover of migrating passenger pigeons once was, that was a fertilizer event, twice a year passenger pigeons dropping, bird droppings, that's a, that was an environmental constant before we eradicated the passenger pigeon. <laughs> the application of tons of pesticide annually is an environmental stressor that will kill off some species eventually while forcing others to evolve as survivors. Those survivors will require yet stronger chemistries to suppress them. And rather than focus on functional soil and healthy plant communities, we will pursue those ever more powerful and profitable synthetic toxins. Even today, and Senator Pearson, I can relay this to him, 
People post pesticide formulas online and advise others on how to apply such home brews. So if you ban glyphosate or product XYZ, this is new, this didn't used to happen 10 years ago, but people will go online and come up with what they see on social media and they'll use that at whatever they're advised to do or as I learned as a combat engineer, I, did, I didn't learn demolitions uh, or engineering through college, but I learned more is better. If you want to take out the bridge, look at the stress, place your explosives, and round up. No pun intended. Make sure it comes down. You don't want to be the poor schmuck standing on a shattered bridge trying to put it yeah. down. More equals better. I'm going to read a few questions here, um, and this comes from my experience at the council meetings. Why do recreational world and ornamental world get free passes when it comes to pesticide use? Think golf courses, Roundup Ready grass seed. Why would there only be two people from recreation? So the world of recreation. I, I, I queried the crowd at my presentation in, in Saratoga in October. National Invasive Species Conference. Two people in the room from recreation. Two people that made their living off of agriculture. It was all agency folks. There's nobody there with work in the ground to make a living. There was one person from the tribes, and there was one person that was self-employed. Recreation and ornamental world get free passes when it comes to chemistry. I include golf, the golf courses in that, essentially. Although they do attend meetings, so, so I salute that. When will we take atrazine seriously? This is another question um, that I posed to you. We've already had gender-confused fish in Lake Champlain, 2016. Fish are complex organisms. We should be concerned, but where is the health department in this swirl of informational indecisiveness? They should be monitoring the health department. They should be monitoring human sperm counts if they need evidence of impacts on human reproduction. Human sperm counts are less than half what they used to be, per a study comparing the 1930s to the 1980s. That's in this book, which was published in the 1990s, Our Stolen Future. Sperm counts were down to half in the 1980s, and who knows where they are now. I don't personally know, but that would be a place to start. Impacts on reproduction, atrazine. It's essentially estrogen. Why are we testing soil for lead and PFAS, but not agrochemicals? We have no benchmarks, no start points. And maybe that's deliberate, and that's a problem. I submit. We get excited about land conservation, but what good is conservation when we then use lofty restoration goals to justify addition of toxins to already depleted landscapes? Your legislature colleagues viewed landscape resilience testimony last Friday, so Friday before last. I ask you, and I ask the head of that committee, was the reduction of pesticide usage mentioned as a goal? Was it mentioned at all? I have not heard back. I'm going to give you some recommendations to achieve future reductions in pesticide usage here. People perform and execute their duties with real focus on when, what they know will be checked and evaluated. Improve on the supervision and consider making it consequential across all fronts. I learned as a lieutenant that if you check gas masks, when your soldiers go to the field, they don't have SpaghettiOs and magazines in their gas mask. They're ready for chemical warfare if need be. They do what, they're know is, what they know is going to be checked. Make that, make that the same with regard to pesticides. I say introduce a secrets tax. For corporations to carry their proprietary secrets into our state, they should be allowed to do so only when they pay the appropriate secrets tax. We need such a tax to determine effects and impacts of all those secret formula chemicals. What the actual tax is or looks like is none of their business. If they wish to know the secret tax, they can offer up some of their corporate secrets. Quid pro quo. Create escrow funds for managing issues associated with misuse of pesticides and direct that manufacturers contribute to this fund. Create another escrow fund to assess direct and indirect impacts of pesticides on the Vermont specific landscape. So we have data that works and applies here rather than across the river. New Hampshire is different soil. The Midwest is different soils. I would also ask that you pay for soil testing to track agrochemical activity and accumulation. If we're paying for lead, let's include atrazine. 
To close out my testimony, I made some bullet points, and I'll try to zip through the bullet points because I think they're pretty concise, so I'll try to close here, and, and I'll certainly invite, welcome your questions on any of them. Reduction of pesticide usage belongs squarely in the global warming discussion since pesticides carry a quadruple CO2 impact. I did look at the, climate, the Global Warming Solutions Act. I did not see pesticide reduction included. Why it's not there, I do not understand. But that's my contention. That's, that's my first bullet point. <laughs> in the global warming discussion, reduce pesticide usage. Pesticide usage is now a massive environmental constant, constant, a stressor. If you want to save maple and ash and hemlock trees from hungry beetles, start by reducing other environmental stressors. The beetles are looking for stressed out trees. So stop, let's stop stressing our trees with another stressor like herbicides. Pesticide usage is currently accepted as normal and necessary, even promoted as the first recourse. Integrated pest management is a concept broken beyond repair. It is a mere catchphrase devoid of valid meaning, like sustainable and green. IPM could be repaired, but that's gonna take some work. If IPM were truly followed in spirit, the funding, the funding for management practices would be more equitably distributed among various approaches. There's a nonprofit in a neighboring state that set aside $50,000 to manage 20 acres near a wetland with chemistry, 50 grand. When the neighbors and the local, there was one person with goats who offered to graze it, the people, the, the neighbors and the residents said, why can't we do this? And we can do it for less than 50 grand. The organization wouldn't, wouldn't hear it. We're gonna spend 50 grand on chemistry or we're gonna work with volunteers. We refuse to work with volunteers because they're ineffective and they require too much supervision. I said, I, I went, they asked me to come testify. I said, fine, 50 grand for chemistry, pay 40 grand to people, I'll train them. You'll save 10 grand, you'll get the work done, you won't have any more oriental bittersweet to worry about and the wetlands won't get contaminated. Why does all the money go to the chemistry approach? That's not integrated pest management in spirit. I would actually say if you want to actually have a bill or even work through it without legislation, just put money into South Burlington, Burlington, the Intervale, that is now doing land management without, they're doing non-chem approaches. Should I pause? Are we good? Sure. So, um, I take, did you go to a meeting last night in your area? I did not attend a meeting last night. Because many of us held public meetings all over the state last <clears throat> night so people could come at night rather than during the day. Perfect, thank you. So, maybe it's not legislators you were talking to. No, sir. <laughs> not, ex not exclusively. <laughs> um, so, uh, any questions for uh, Michael? I have a few remaining bullet points, which I'm happy to cover. Yeah, the crew's outside, and I don't think you were here yet when I announced we were going to have to change rooms. So, could you sum them up sure. really quick? Happy to do so. Thank you. Um, also, I'm on the bullet points. Alternatives to pesticides are routinely ignored and financially discouraged in academia as well as in agencies. Soil testing does not monitor for pesticides. Cornell, ask Cornell what they do for soil tests. They'll test for everything, but I've asked, pesticides are not covered. Health considerations regarding exposure to pesticides are non-existent in Vermont. Look at the five-year cancer plan, look at obesity, endocrine issues. Let's get the health folks in the conversation. Permitting I covered does not account for real, real world conditions, drought, et cetera. Academia is not a leader in this field and does not wish to be. That's kind of a strong statement, but I did hear back from UVM, which I salute, but I have yet to hear back from some schools when I ask about CO2 impacts and pesticide usage. I'll name them, Middlebury, Bennington, Dartmouth. Talk to me. UVM did respond, I salute that. Use of herbicides completely eliminates economic opportunities associated with invasive species. This is a bucky state. This does sell in garden centers, made out of buckthorn, rock-resistant, invasive species. 
You can use this in your garden. I even leave the twigs on so you can string up your peas. That's an economic opportunity. No one wants bucky steaks or Japanese knotweed paper if it's got glyphosate on it. I think I've shown you this before. This is paper made from Japanese knotweed. We're doing a huge workshop in Springfield, April 28th. Should I stop here, sir? Uh, yeah, we, unfortunately. We, yeah. I wanted to make the economics point. Yeah, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. We got a gang outside the door waiting. Very good, Proud thank you.